Parasternal block is a technique by which the anterior cutaneous intercostal branches of the chest are anesthetized directly adjacent to the sternum. The anatomy and technique are straightforward, and it has some good utility in a number of settings. In this video, we'll discuss the relevant anatomy and outline two separate approaches to this block. Parasternal blocks exist to solve a problem. If we do a paravertebral block, we anesthetize both the dorsal and ventral rami, in other words, the entire chest wall from midline to midline. As each intercostal nerve travels around the chest, the lateral cutaneous branch emerges at about the mid-axillary line. This provides skin and subcutaneous coverage from here to here. This is the target for the pex 2 and serratus fascial plane blocks. You can see that if you only anesthetize the lateral cutaneous nerves, you do miss the midline. And we certainly see this with both pex and serratus. There is midline sparing. For breast surgery, it's often enough just to perform some local infiltration of the soft tissues. However, for trauma or surgery of the deeper midline chest, subcute infiltration is not going to cut it, and we need to target the anterior cutaneous nerves themselves. Here's a cross-section of the sternum and parasternal structures. You can see the pec major and internal intercostal muscles attaching to the sternum. There's a neurovascular space, and then a final muscle, the transversus thoracus muscle. This muscle is fine, wispy, and often invisible to ultrasound, so what we frequently see deep to the neurovascular space is the pleura. The nerves travel around the chest deep to internal intercostal muscle, then pass superficially to innervate the skin, sub-Q tissues, and the periosteum of the sternum. You should also be able to see the internal mammary artery. This is a big, important vessel, so care must be taken not to contact this with the needle. The nomenclature of these blocks is a little confusing. There have been several different attempts to name the two basic approaches, but there is one principle that underpins all of them. That is, the nerve starts deep and travels up toward the surface just lateral to the sternum, so local place at any point along its vertical pathway should work. For example, a needle can be advanced to the plane just deep to pec major and above the internal intercostal muscle. This has been termed the pecto-intercostal fascial plane block, and local anesthetic placed here will catch the nerve on its way up to the surface. A needle can also be placed below the intercostal muscle in the neurovascular plane. This block is commonly known as the transversus thoracic plane block. Sonographically, this thin, wispy muscle is difficult to see in many cases, and the vessels often appear to rest directly adjacent to the pleura. It's important to understand that no matter which approach you choose, superficial or deep to the intercostal muscle, the goal is the same. 20 mils of local anesthetic placed here should result in a sensory block of the anterior cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves 2 through 6. These blocks have been used as an adjunct to pex or serratus plane block for breast surgery, and studies have demonstrated superior analgesia with that combo compared to pex alone. One of the growing indications is for midline sternotomy for cardiac surgery or thymectomy. We've also used this block in the trauma setting for those patients that have pain from sternal fracture. Let's take a look at these two approaches. With the pecto-intercostal approach, the aim is to advance a needle through pec major muscle until it lands in the plane between pec and internal intercostal, seen here in blue. The local anesthetic should spread between these two muscles and over the costal cartilages. It doesn't appear to matter whether you approach from the caudad or cephalad aspect. We see the needle coming from the inferior aspect here, and the local anesthetic lifting the pec muscle up off the intercostal. A good sign is the local spreading up over the humps of the cartilages. Our preferred approach for the transversus thoracic plane block is a little different, and that's because of the presence of the internal mammary vessels that are deep to the intercostal muscle. We need to ensure we see it clearly throughout the block procedure, and capturing it in cross-section using a transverse orientation is the safest way. You can see the slips of transversus thoracus muscle in blue here. The needle will pass through both pec and intercostal muscles, and the local will spread out in the neurovascular plane between intercostal and transversus thoracus muscles. Here's why it's important to clearly see the mammary vessels with the TTP approach. This is a transverse view showing the sternum and the muscles and pleura just lateral to the sternal edge. The internal mammary vessels are very clearly seen here in cross-section. If we rotate 90 degrees to the parasagittal orientation, we see a nice view of the cartilages and a dark area next to the pleura which almost looks like a nice target for intercostal block. This is the internal mammary vein. Shifting the probe laterally brings up the pulsatile mammary artery, and then back to the vein again. Anytime you're imaging vessels in long axis, it can be easy to miss them. 
Doing the TTP block in the parasagittal orientation requires very careful attention to these vessels, which can be not all that obvious. So here we are back to the transverse view. The probe obviously has to be positioned between the ribs to see the soft tissue structures. And once again, we see the pec, the internal intercostal, and the internal mammary artery just above the pleura. It's hard to say where, if at all, the transversus thoracus muscle is. The needle is advanced from the lateral aspect passing through the pec muscle. A small injection to hydrolocate the needle tip shows that we're in the intercostal muscle itself. The needle is advanced another few millimeters and the test injections repeated until we see the injectate depressing the pleura and spreading medially. 20 mils are then administered here. And here are some tips for parasternal nerve blocks. Like many fascial plane blocks, it's sometimes difficult to achieve perfect unzippering of the planes with the pecto-intercostal approach. It can be useful to divide your dose and do two to three injections rather than counting on one injection spreading to all levels. This is an argument in favor of the TTP or deep approach. There's little resistance to spread in this plane and we find that single injections achieve excellent spread in most cases. Of course, this has to be balanced against the potential hazards of the deeper approach, including pneumothorax and injury to the mammary vessels. Overall, with ultrasound guidance, these blocks seem relatively safe, and one case series of 300 deep blocks demonstrated no serious complications. Secondly, an out-of-plane approach is fine too, and sometimes can be quicker and easier, especially if there's a lot of muscle on the chest wall that might make an in-plane approach challenging. Careful, frequent hydrolocation is the key to safety here. Finally, it's best to do these blocks prior to the surgeon disrupting the planes. We know that after mammary artery harvesting, the spread is far less ideal. At the same time, if you do these blocks before a long case, it's useful to consider adding adjuvants to the local anesthetic to maximize the effect of the block. 